Hello and welcome to another edition of Product Chat, Pragmatic Institute's webinar and podcast series where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product teams. I'm Eddie Gordon, Courseware Designer at Pragmatic Institute and today's host. A few things to note here at the top. If you have questions during today's presentation, and we hope and anticipate that you will, go ahead and stick them in the Q&A box. If you've not used Zoom for a webinar before, look down on the bottom row, you will notice that you have a new box that says Q&A. Click that one open, and as you have questions about the presentation, stick them in there. If you still wanna use the chat box to chat to your fellow attendees during the presentation, go for it do it. But I will be keeping an eye primarily on the Q&A box for questions that I will toss over to our presenter. We'll sprinkle some in during and then uh, save some time for a Q&A session at the end. So that's how we'll do that. Yes, there will be a recording made available of the whole discussion that's going to be sent out to all the registrants in the coming days. So put your pencils down and just listen and enjoy, you'll get the whole thing recorded. And then last item, I want to make sure to promo the next in our product chat series. We're always hoping to have webinars designed to give you actionable takeaways that are useful for your career. And this one will be no different. Join us Thursday, December 16th, 1 p.m. Eastern time. We're gonna be joined by our very own Rebecca Caligeris and Ian Templin, for a conversation. We saw as we released our recent product industry survey, we saw a big shift in the product marketing field from tactical sales enablement to strategic planning, which is cool. We wanted to see that, but we definitely are seeing it now in the survey results. So we're gonna have Ian and Rebecca on to talk about and look at some of the new tools and approaches that we have for the product marketing industry and roles to help you focus on critical metrics and to better connect your message to your buyer. So that is the next product check, December 16th. Be sure to register for that one. And with that, it is time to introduce our guest for the day, who is the Senior Vice President of Product at OfferPad. He is a results-oriented technology and go-to-market leader with extensive product management and marketing experience in both SaaS and enterprise software products. He's a proven leader with a passion for developing products that delight customers, teams that meet or exceed objectives, and market insights that enable rapid growth. Aren't we all fans of those things? <laughs> Ted Best, it is so good to have you with us, Ted. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling great, Eddie. Thanks so much for inviting me to uh, to come speak to the community. I, I am a pragmatic alum, so really enjoy the opportunity to come back and and speak to the community and, and give back to the community. Like you said, I have I have a long history with product management. I think I'm on over 21 years of product management in all sorts of organizations, startup to Fortune 500, different industries. I'm currently doing consumer B2C products, service-enabled products uh, at OfferPad. So that's a that's a recent change. So uh, I love learning. I love exploring different topics. So excited to be here. Wonderful. Well, we have to that we have titled today's presentation: How Market Visits Can Elevate Your Product Roadmap. We all got roadmaps, or should, and we all want them elevated. So please. Ted. <laughs> Take it away and tell us how to do that with our market visits. Fantastic. Thanks, Eddie. And also, um, welcome, everyone. I can only see Eddie in, in the, uh, on the screen here. So as you mentioned, I do want to make this collaborative. You know, I, we have a lot of material to go over, but this is such a rich in, uh, topic to explore. If you guys do have questions, like Eddie mentioned, put it in the QA tab and he can either like wave, you know, blow a whistle or something, get my attention and I'll stop. And uh, we can dig into that topic a little bit. So uh, I want to keep it, you know, this is a chat. So, hey, let's chat. So with that, let's dive right into it. Uh, I have to admit up front, I love customer visits or market visits. I take every possible opportunity I can to go out and talk with customers, uh, experience their world. 
What I think is most beneficial about customer visits, it's a high bandwidth communication. Uh, you can see that you're in there. Uh, ideally, if you're doing an, an on-site visit, you're in the customer's environment. You can you can see how their cube is arranged, what kind of you know uh, uh, interruptions they're getting, how they're doing their work. You can really experience what it's like, kind of be an apprentice and learn that customer's job, so you can bring that real-world context back to your road mapping. And uh, what I use that information for is mainly one. First and foremost, identifying new opportunities for driving revenue and delighting customers. Most of my innovation comes from exploring unmet needs, new user segments, uh, new workflows that I can extend uh, my products to. But also it, these interactions provide a wealth of color commentary, right? When you're socializing your roadmap, you're, you're doing your storytelling, the verbatims, the day in the life, the, the experience stories, are really kind of what I find puts your roadmap over the top because a roadmap in and of itself tells you what is gonna be done and approximately when it's gonna be done, but it doesn't tell you why, right? And that's usually the question most people ask when you're doing a roadmap presentation or walking them through a roadmap is why this, not that? Why this now versus that later? And this customer, in, this color commentary you can provide from the customer visits is really gonna help you answer those questions. Um, also, when you're doing visits, understand what you're trying to learn. There's different ways to approach these visits. You can do formal project research where you do a very you know, in-depth plan about which segments you're going to visit, how many interviews are you gonna do for each segment. That's great for exploring new opportunities. But also there's a theory that you, you should do less of that and do more of unstructured, shorter, frequent interactions with your customers to get real-time input into your development process. And we'll talk a little bit about both of those approaches in a second. Don't forget your competitive interviews. These seem, you know, when I first learned, went through Pragmatic and they told me you should be doing, you know, interviewing your customers and, and prospective customers, I said, yeah, I can see how to do that and your competitor's customers, I went, how am I gonna make that happen? It actually turns out it's not as difficult as you might seem. In the B2C space, where we're working at OfferPad, we do, we do real estate transactions. So it's actually not that hard to find someone who's done a transaction with our competitor and they're very open to doing an interview on what was it like, what technology did you use, what, did you, what experience did you have? In the B2B world, it might be a little bit more different, but usually when you say, hey, we're going to do, you, you approach them as we're doing open-ended market research into this area, you'll find a lot of people will sign up, especially if there's a small incentive and you can get those competitive interviews. So make sure you put keep those on your radar. And one interesting thing, if, you, if you're in a larger corporation and you're doing software for finance or marketing or operations or legal if you can get those departments to use your software, basically eat your own dog food, then you have instant access to 10, 15 customers, real world customers. They're real customers using your software to solve real problems to drive you know, those customer interviews. So that's a little bit of overview about customer interviewing and some of the data you can gather in the approach. How often should you do it? And this is a question I get asked a lot. How much is you know too much? How much is too little? To me, you know, my basic answer is as many and as often as you can is what you should push for. The challenge with customer interviews, it's very easy to push those to the background, right? Marketing is in your face, finance is in your face, development is in your face, sales is in your face, all asking for time and 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 putting demands on your agenda. It's your customers aren't asking you ever to go out and visit them. So you really have to kind of force yourself. So what I recommend is set up a cadence that you can stick to, whether it's, you know, one visit a week, six visits a month, X visit a quarters, put that in as a goal for yourself and your teams and hold yourselves accountable to it. It is a forcing mechanism, but sometimes that's something you need to do to make the visits happen. We're going to talk a little bit about this, a new concept from a woman named Teresa Torres, who's a discovery coach around continuous 
discovery, basically continuous interaction with your customers that I think is super interesting. And it's something I'm looking forward to trying to put in place here at OfferPad. So what data can we gather? Um, again, these are rich sources of data. You can gather a whole bunch of different dimensions around the customer experience. You can get experience stories, verbatims, understand their workflow, jobs to be done, days in life, customer journeys, user segments. It's just a wealth of data. In fact, there's a design approach called contextual design that I used in 2018 to build out the new customer front end for CT Corporation. And the approach basically is to do that formal project research planning go out into the fields and spend up to a day with your customer acting like an apprentice, following that customer around, learning their job, just like somebody would be learning that job if they were a new hire, so that you get very ingrained in that work. And then you come back to the team. And as a team, you dissect within the first 24 to 48 hours, you dissect that visit in detail and extract all of the verbatims, the workflows, and the data points, and then build affinity maps right there to start building out a picture of the pains and possible solutions to those pains for that customer. And instead of kind of going through a design thinking process, the picture of the product and the solution just kind of bubbles up out of the different interviews that you conduct. You start seeing patterns and themes and it just kind of bubbles up as you do each interview. It's a very interesting approach to design and, and leveraging customer information, but I found it was, it was interesting and it was effective. It's a very project heavy. We were supported by a central UI UX team, so we were able to approach it, but it's something if you're interested in, in doing, really adopting that approach of in-context interviewing, it's something you might want to think about. Ted, we've got a good question in the Q&A over there that's related to what you're talking about now. I think it's from Eric and Eric says, with so many topics that need to be addressed in customer interviews, how do we address them all without overwhelming the customer or mm. ruining that relationship? Obviously, I mean, you, this is a fantastic method for discovering what questions you need to be asking, but uh, presumably you're just gonna come up with tons of them. And how do you avoid ticking off any particular uh, interviewee <laughs> that you're talking to? Two things. Um, and this, this will go a little bit when we talk about the roadmap cycle. I, I do kind of two types of visits. One is if I'm doing ideation, if I'm looking for new problems to solve, it's more of a conversation around experiences, day in the life, and exploring user segments. So it's more of a high-level, open-ended kind of conversation. If I'm looking for specific ideas on how to solve specific pains. It's a little bit more focused on workflows and jobs to be done. So understanding what you're trying to learn will kind of help you structure how are you going to do that visit, if that makes sense. Don't go in there and try to learn everything in one visit. Understand what you need to learn to answer the questions you have open, either for ideation or prioritization or as part of your design thinking, understand what you need to get, and then have that conversation with the customer. And then spread the love, right? You should be, my golden rule is if you really want to understand a topic deeply, you probably need to have five to 12 interviews around that topic. So if you're exploring a new user segment, you're gonna to go to five to 12 different customers to get that. Some people now are saying six to eight, but if you have that, again, this is qualitative information, not quantitative information. You're trying to get directional. I think the pain is here. I think you know, the new opportunity is there. It's, it points you in the right direction. It surfaces opportunities. And then you need to do further discovery to, get, you know, to fine tune what the opportunity is. And then you also need to follow it up if you want to be super rigorous with quantitative efforts, surveying and other market research. Does that help? Really? It sure does. And, and I love that you actually even gave some recommendations of number ranges. That's very useful because often we're scared to commit to a specific range, but 
But I think that helps because some people may be thinking, if I don't ask all the questions to all of my interviews, the data is useless. And that's just not the case. That's just not the case. Yeah. So let me, let me talk a little bit about continuous discovery. And this is a, an interesting approach, again, from Teresa Torres. Uh, she's a Disney. Oh, yay. We're recording. So the idea here is project-based, what I talked about with in-context interviewing and, and doing the big plan and doing several interviews across multiple user segments is useful, but it isn't as important as maintaining a constant stream of visits with your customers. So what Teresa recommends is do weekly touch points with customers driven by the team actually building the, the software where you conduct small research activities in pursuit of a specific outcome, right? So if you're looking, you have a specific product outcome, a specific OKR that you're building a solution for, you should be meeting weekly with customers. And the benefit there is, is twofold. One, we make product decisions every day. Every day people come to us and say, especially when you're in kind of the design mode, something is engineering, you know, should we put this here? Should we put that there? What does the logic need to be? How does the work supposed to, supposed to flow? If you're in weekly contact with your customers, you know every Friday you're going to have an opportunity to ask the customer those questions. And just like we move from waterfall to agile, from agile to continuous deployment, why take a waterfall-like project-based uh, approach to discovery. You should be doing, if you're doing continual development, you should be doing continual discovery. So it's a really interesting shift in how you work with your customers, meet with them on a regular basis, and almost go into a co-creation mode. You're building the solution with the customer. You're not building the solution and then going to them and validating it with the customer. You'll do usability testing you know, with the customers later or using something like usertesting.com. But when you're building it, when you're building, conceptualizing it, having that constant interaction with the customers. Ted, we had a question pop up from Nick that's perfectly relevant here. Nick says, doesn't continual discovery lead to scope creep? Oh, interesting question. Does it lead <laughs> to scope creep? It can. So uh, scope creep is... So I like to say there's good scope creep and bad scope creep. Good scope creep is something that should be encouraged and it's actually kind of supported by agile software development, right? As you learn from your customers, you learn how to make your product better and better and better. So you should be thinking about how you're going to iterate based on customer feedback, right? To me, that is good scope creep. I've learned how to make my product fit the market need better. So I need to consider, you know, you know, do I add this and make the product better or do I move it to the next release? That's a decision that you can make, but you've actually discovered a, a good piece of scope creep. Bad scope creep is, well, you know, there's kind of another feature that I'd like to put in or well, we didn't do enough discovery, so we, so we missed a critical thing that we need to go back and fix. So I think what Nick is asking about is how do you support good scope creep? And that is basically timelines and in, in what you need. You found some useful information. Can you fit that in your agile development and keep schedule? Great. You should add it. If you can't fit it in, then you have a you have an issue. You know that you now have a gap between product and your market. So you have a product market fit gap. Do you have enough value with shipping what you have to actually fill fulfill most of the need? Okay, you, sh you could probably leave that to version two, if that makes sense. Very cool. Hope that helped, Nick. So think about continuous discovery. Again, it's something I'm going to try and do at OfferPad this coming year. So road mapping. I like to think of road mapping as this circle that keeps turning, right? It goes through phases. Road mapping kind of, the way I think about it, happens almost in the middle that is where you kind of churn out or middle towards the end is where you churn out the actual roadmap. But it starts all the way back with, in the blue dot, 
around identifying what's next, identifying those opportunities, those ideas for innovation. You push those and pressure test them against your product strategy. Quick rant here. I have worked for companies that have very loosely defined product strategies, mostly because they have loosely defined company strategies. Like our strategy is we're going to make our numbers next year. Okay. There's lots of ways to make the numbers. If you don't have a well-defined company strategy and it's leading to a very vague product strategy, you don't have a true north for the map that you're building, right? You, if you're making a map, you have to know where north is because you need to plot a direction from where you are to where you're going. And if you don't know where that is, well, then any random feature will get you there. So, you know, ask yourself, do you know what the product strategy is? If you don't know, then you need to work to get one. If you, if it's still vague, then by default, the product team needs to invent a product strategy. And it may or may not be aligned, but at least you have a north that you can move towards. So that's just a little bit of soapbox. But I have worked with companies where it makes road mapping really hard because you don't know where you're going. So opportunity identification, check it against product strategy. Then you go into solution and concept testing. And in that arc is where I use a lot of the customer visit, you know, that rich context information about what real world problems are we solving. When I get to prioritization, I actually flip a little bit more into the quantitative, doing understanding my pervasiveness, the actual impact I'm delivering for my business, what's the dev cost going to be, how does this fit with product strategy, to come up with a score for the contents in my roadmap, and then I stack rank and I draw a line based on dev capacity. And those are my rough cut for what I'm going to be planning for the for the roadmap. And then I use qualitative information to finesse the tuning, right? It's art and science. So are there some delighter features in here? I can see the pain, right? This is a huge pain point that struck a nerve in my customer. Maybe, you know, it's, it's for some reason pervasive or whatever, it's driven it lower in the roadmap. If, if it's about to be, the, dry, the line is about to be drawn and it's gonna be below the line, Sometimes I'll move it above the line because I need to invest in delighters. And I can tell this is a delighter. And the way I know that is from my customer visit information. So once my prioritization is done, right, the next step is socialization, right? And I tend to do this in a fairly public way, right? I tend uh, to do this because first and foremost, I feel that the the product roadmap is a communication tool. It's telling the organization what we're doing when, what's coming next. And you should pretty widely distribute that across the organization. You have to, depending on your organization, the sensitivity to it, you may need to create two versions of your roadmap, you know, one for you know, the sales team, don't tell anybody I said that, and one for, for other folks. But that's, that is just something you have to feel with your organization. And then you're, you're, once you're done with socialization, then guess what? You can catch a breath, you know, take a couple of days off, and it starts all over again. This wheel consistently turns, right? Your roadmap content is moving from the right to the left. And why that's important to understand this cycle is you're going to have to do another roadmap update in three months you need to start planning out what your customer discovery, what customer visits do you need to do now that you've finished the last roadmap so that you are ready when prioritization happens in three months, six months, whatever your cycle is. You need to understand what you need to learn next and make a plan for it. All right? Okay. So socialization. I tend to do, again, like I said, pretty broad socialization. You have to remember the why doesn't appear on your roadmap. You have the what and the when. I tend to color code. You jump back really quick. This is an example. I use product plan, blatant product pitch. It's a super helpful tool. I color code the features on my roadmap back to strategic themes. 
So my business stakeholders can take a look at the roadmap and if, if orange means growth, they can laser like drill in and say, these are the features that are driving growth. If yellow is cost reduction, they can drill in and say, these are the features driving cost reduction. It just helps add a little extra dimension of the why to the what and the when. But really, I socialize it. You should set up a cadence for socializing it, whether it's, I tend to do monthly updates on progress against the roadmap, quarterly updates for actual changes to the roadmap. My progress updates are tend to be business, you know, smaller group of business stakeholders that have a vested interest in the work that we're doing. The roadmap changes, I tend to do very publicly. Like one of my CEOs used to call it the cast of Ben-Hur meeting, right? There's like 60 people in this meeting, not just from our division, but our centralized support team. We had centralized IT, we had centralized development, we had a centralized UX team. Our roadmap integrated with other division roadmaps. We had a bunch of people in that meeting. And we would walk through changes to the roadmap, new investment opportunities. I wouldn't go through everything. I would only go through the most important things. And the most important pieces to the ads and changes to the roadmap were verbatims to emphasize pervasiveness. So if I was adding a new thing to the roadmap, I would usually have a slide where I put Here's the new thing in the center. And then around it, I would put eight to 10 customer verbatims that would emphasize the pain that this, this feature or product was solving. I would also include at least one day in the life story that tells the story of Joe coming to work and sitting down and using our software, but he also has to use two other spreadsheets and he has to toggle out of this software and go into another application to get that data and cut and paste it just so that they feel the pain in the workflow. And you can say, well, this is Joe, but I talked to eight other Joes and they're all feeling the same pain. Just again, bring that real world context, bring the, the pain that you're solving and make it tangible because just a feature on the roadmap is not, is not gonna cut it. They're gonna ask, why is that one there versus the one that I really wanted? And you can get in front of those conversations. The next thing you want to do, especially if you're doing big public meetings, is you have to understand where all of your hippos are at, right? And make sure you don't have any angry hippos. Nobody likes an angry hippo. Highly important person's personal opinion, right? Those are the people who can stand up and derail those big roadmap conversations. And typically, you know who they are because you've had a roadmap conversation and it's been derailed. So find out who those people are, and then hold a one-on-one -on -one -on -one pre-meeting with them to align and get their understanding of the roadmap. I didn't say agreement with the roadmap. I just said understanding of the roadmap, the why these things are on here, how are the contents of the roadmap supporting their business outcomes, and see if you are aligned or if you have an issue. And if you have an issue, do they you know, do they agree to the roadmap or is there a problem? Because if there's a problem, you want to work on that and solve it at least to a agree to disagree before you do the big public unveiling, if that makes sense. Uh, another thing, another trick to managing, managing your hippos, they are experts in their area of the business. And if they are a business stakeholder of yours, consider bringing them into a co-creation type atmosphere so that they don't, you haven't done all the work, you haven't done all the conceptual design, detail design, worked with your stakeholders, get this ready for development. And the first time they're understanding the feature is when it, when it pops up on the roadmap. Bring them into the design process, get their input early. You are not ceding your control over the design, right? You and the, and the development and the design team own the solutioning. You're just trying to make sure that you're aligning the, the product outcomes that drive business outcomes to whatever those business outcomes of your hippo are trying to manage. It's a really effective way to do it. And that's socialization. So we've gone through 
strategy. We've gone through a little bit of prioritization, road mapping, socialization. Again, we've just done our roadmap presentation and now you're ready to start over. And now you're ready to dive into ideation. If you're doing your customer visits and you're extracting the data, there are usually ideas in ideation and innovation concepts already at your fingertips, right? You have understood the workflows, you've identified unmet needs, right? You found new users that, that you haven't explored that, that you can go and, and, and potentially mine those new users as an extension of your product. You should go back to your customer interviews and see, is there a thread you can pull on and then make your research plan Again, if you're doing continuous discovery, you know, that next Friday conversation, tell me, Mr. Customer, more about your experience with working with this to start developing those innovation threads. If you're challenged, right, you've, the well's gone dry, right? Uh, you can do internal crowdsourcing or external crowdsourcing. I've done this. It generates a lot of ideas. A lot of times they're not on point. And so... You have to sift through a lot of that to find any kind of nuggets. I prefer something more like a hackathon approach where you can set a specific challenge to them and develop multiple solutions and compare and contrast and potentially get one or two winning ideas that you can then take back to customers. Or again, co-creation. Co-creation, bring your customers in. I did this while I was at CT Corporation, we brought customers into the design session. And if you're doing design thinking, Lean UX, Google Design Sprints, having the customer in there real time is fantastic. Anytime you're talking about the workflow, the customer can tell you, this is how my company does it. If you have two, you can say, well, you know, again, is this how you do it, do it as well? You get instant real-time feedback to drive that product market fit. And that's ideation. And that pretty much is that. So in summary, do customer visits, make it a central part of your discovery. It really is the quickest and easiest high bandwidth way to, to understand your customers, both from an innovation standpoint, a design standpoint, and you know, supporting your prioritization and socialization. Create a cadence so it becomes part of your DNA. It's just how you roll, how you your team rolls, how you understand the customers on the market. The output is going to help you with fine tuning the roadmap and you know give you those powerful storytelling can, storytelling uh, data points to help you win those conversations, those difficult conversations, especially with your hippos. Manage your hippos. No one likes an angry hippo. And then finally, force yourself to make time for innovation. That is it. Some helpful Brilliant. resources. Oh, I love that. The last slide there with the summaries on it, that is the gold of the presentation, I think, right there. If anybody was not quick enough to grab a screenshot of that, don't worry. You're going to get the whole presentation in a recording here very soon. So, Ted, we have some fantastic questions coming into the Q&A. I didn't want to interrupt you with every one of them because I wanted to make sure you got through the whole process. I thought that was important. This cycle is what we're talking about today. You can't just do one piece. You got to make sure you complete the cycle, start again. And so we've got some questions that go back to some of the previous steps in the process, but I think that is just fine. I'll tell you what, folks, let's start the Q&A session here. If you have some questions you just haven't put in there yet, click down there on that Q&A button to open up the Q&A panel and stick them in there for me so we can keep them all sorted. I'll do my best if you happen to have put them in the chat uh, to pull them out of there as best I can. And while they're thinking of their last really good questions, though, we want to go ahead and do a quick poll specifically about today's presentation. This is us doing our market research. How about that? Real time, eating our dog food, as you said, Ted. Love so, it. So, uh, folks, quick three-question poll just popped up on your screens. Answer that for us real quick so that we can listen to our customers and adapt as needed from that. And then... Ted, I've got, um, I wanted to start off with this question here from Aaron. You had mentioned at one point that you'd worked with some companies that didn't have that true north. You, they, they didn't have the goal and so therefore nothing to be specifically working 
uh, towards or, or, or any way to sort of sift all of these ideas and make sure that we're aligned with a roadmap. Aaron has a good question. He says, what is the tipping point where you question the true north itself when discovering pain points, JTBD opportunities that don't align with that original true north? So I know you'd said, you know, pick something. Pick, you've got to have a target to shoot at. But that's a good question there. If we did just pick something, how do we assess that something, that true north, and make sure that we don't need to adjust that at some point? No, that's, that's a great question. I think... To me, it when you're adjusting your two, you know, there's two things I think that I look for when I'm when when I need to adjust my two north. One is, are the product outcomes that we're trying to push for not delivering the business outcomes that the business wants to, you know, is signing up for, right? Uh, that's that's an easy check, right? The product team doesn't usually drive business outcomes. The product will drive business outcomes through you know, the product outcomes it generates. If you want to, you know, reduce churn or you want to drive growth, you may need to attract new users. So what do you need to do in the product to attract those new users or increase engagement? And if your product strategy is failing to deliver those business outcomes, that is one one time where you're gonna where you're gonna say, hey, we need to, we need to readjust our our true north. The second is when you're doing your customer visits and your customers are telling you that you know there are new pains to solve that you, that are not in your current product strategy that's a time when you can reevaluate your product strategy or the way you are currently solving this product this problem is no longer sufficient so when i worked for a startup startup doing software for legal departments it came, you know, we would go out to visit customers and we sit down and say, tell us about, you know, what you're, what you're thinking about as far as systems now in the future. How are you going to manage the work that you do and what systems are going to use? We had a system that managed invoicing and we always thought invoicing was in the middle of the world, right? That's what people were excited about. That's all of our users, you know, are using this. So we had kind of our little echo chamber that managing legal expenses was super, super important. But when we would go out and talk to department leaders, they would draw a map where they would put case management in the middle. And we were just this one little satellite off to the side, including contract automation, document automation, you know, time tracking. We were just a tiny dot. But the middle, the core of everything was somebody else's system. And then we had those competitors start announcing the same functionality that we delivered. So we could see the writing on the wall. Our customers were telling us, hey, you're about to be disintermediated. You got to change your product strategy, <laughs> right? right? You have to meet that market need as it changes. And the one way, you, one of your great sensing tools are those customer visits. Brilliant. Ted, we have several questions in the Q&A and in the chat about your resources, your tools that you are using to create these roadmaps. You had some pretty colors in yours and uh, lots of folks want to know, how do I assign pretty colors to my roadmap? Look at you that, know, we have a resources slide. It's like <laughs> we predicted it, nice. So I've recently started using product plan. Before that, you know, I was, you know, Excel, PowerPoint, trying to make those silly shapes line up and then I'd spend an hour doing that and somebody would say, oh, you know what, we're going to, we're going to pivot and like, oh my God, we have to redo <laughs> all this stuff. I like product plan. I've just started using it. It is kind of a, you know, if you're an Alton Brown cooking show fan, it's, it's a unitasker. I think right now it just helps you make, you know, good looking roadmaps in a very short amount of time that are very easy to change. So it is a real productivity just exclusively for making roadmaps. And that little roadmap picture I had earlier, that was from product plan. So mm -hmm. I'm using it. I can, I can say it's good. What I'd like product plan to actually add to their, one feature I'd like them to add is the ability to do prioritization in there. So I can keep more of my work in product plan. I'm still using Excel and other things to do do that work. I am looking at AHA and product board. They give you more functionality for doing that. 
The challenge is I don't like the way they output their roadmaps. So I'm kind of like six of one, half a dozen of the other. Interesting. Okay. And boy, this is a uh, sparked conversation in the chat too. Here's a recommendation for AHA as well. Don't know if you've used that one. Yeah. Some love for product plan and for Miro also in the chat. Figma is a new one here. So folks, yep. it, not just the slide, but you've got some recommendations from your peers over there in the chat for some cool tools to try out as well. Fantastic. Glad for that, Ted. Ted, I've got a question here that I have heard before and the fact that lots of people still ask this one means that maybe we need another take on it. So I'm gonna to toss it over to you as well. This one from April that says, given that marketing doesn't own customer relationships, how do you work with other teams to establish that contact with the customers? And while she didn't specifically state it, I can tell you this often brings up the idea of the marketing sales divide. But what are your thoughts on there? How do you not scare sales that you're going to chase away their best customers and still get the yeah. information? You know, it, it, and I think there's different answers between B2C and B2B. Uh, I Good. think the customer relationship issue is a little bit more prevalent in, in B2B enterprise software. So when I want to go to customers and get feedback, I typically don't go to sales first. I go to account management because they're the ones who tend to keep the longer term relationships with the customers if you're in enterprise B2B space. Sometimes if you have someone, someone who's managing NPS, you can go to them because they're looking for promoters and detractors. And as part of the MPS process, they ask, do you want to be contacted? There's another way to go out and contact customers, you know, understanding their problems and solving their problems is of course, part of the MPS feedback loop. You can go to support, right? Customer support is another area where again, you know, they're supporting customer issues. You can potentially do it there. Sales relationships are tough, especially with prospective customers, right? They are trying to win a piece of business. They're a little leery about you, you know, disrupting the sale. So with sales relationships, um, with prospective customers, I offer to go out on the sales call. And salespeople love it when the product guy comes out on the sales call, because there's always those tough questions, does your software do X? And they want to go product guy. And <laughs> if you're there, they see you as a resource. But while you're there, what do good salespeople do? They ask the customer, what do you need? What are your problems? How does your workflow work? Those are a lot of the same questions you would be asking on a customer visit. So you can team with sales and get that same information. Brilliant. Good take. Sounds like it will be an ongoing struggle and probably a case by case basis, but it's always good to have another view and some successful tips on, on how to manage that relationship. Ted, let's get uh, psychological here for a little bit. We've got a question from Kenya who says, what are some strategies you use to avoid biases like confirmation bias in oh, your yeah. engagements? Huh? Great, great question. So there's, there's, you know, confirmation bias, there's kind of that personal attribution bias where you fall in love with your own, your own solution. What, what I do is before you're building the solution, before you've locked into a solution, because one challenge product teams can do is they can lock in very early on a solution. We have this problem, let's get in, let's solve it, and let's, let's create the solution. And then you take it out and you go out and, and try and confirm and validate that this solution is right. And confirmation bias is like, well, if they tell you, you tend to kind of absorb the positive and forget the negative. One way to do that is create two solutions, right? Don't get locked into just one solution. Create two. Get feedback on both, right? That should help you hopefully, you know, separate you getting attached to a particular solution, keep an open mind, let the customer tell you. Another way to do that again is do early co-creation with the customer. If you identify a problem, go ask the customer how they might solve it, 
bring those customers in early in the design process. So you don't do a whole bunch of work and have a huge investment build up in this, this one solution that you go back and then try and try and validate. Brilliant. Here's one from Avnish who says, how can we use this in creating user personas? Is that applicable oh, here? Absolutely. What I do is identify user segments, right? So the user segment is the group of users that you are serving. And then the persona is a reflection of that user segment. So when you're going out and you're doing your discovery, I typically... Before I start a customer, you know, a customer shadowing session, I will go through a short questionnaire that I'm using across multiple customer visits to gather data that you can use to kind of help understand the user segment, who they are, how long they've been there, what their title is, where did they work before they worked here, what does a day in the life look like, how are they measured, right, what are their goals, I think that's super important to understand. If there's a person in your role using your software and your software is helping them get their jobs done, how are they compensated? What are they measured at? So you, I usually do a little demographics before the visit. I understand the user segment that I'm going after with my, my, with my customer visit so I can build up that information that you can then create a persona off of. Ted, we have had so many good questions come into the Q&A. And I know you've got another meeting to run off to. I'm sure lots of our audience does as well. If some of these folks wanted to get you some more questions we didn't get to today, is there a way that they could send them to you? And, and uh, what's the best way to get in contact if they wanted? To? Absolutely. Ted.best at offerpad.com. Brilliant. There we go. Well, folks, we will keep track of all the questions that didn't go answered today and do our best to maybe publicize those in some of our locations so we can put some in the in the pack that's a great place to do that and then you just heard ted his invitation to send them to him as well ted before we wrap up i always would like to uh, present one question at the end here that kind of sums everything up and that is from all of that we've talked about today if there were let's say two things that you would have our audience do differently now that they've heard you speak based on everything we've talked about, what, what two things would you recommend they do differently from now on? One thing, make, take that step to make customer visits part of your DNA. Make it just how you roll. That's easier, easier said than done, but set yourself those goals, set yourself the quotas, just start doing it. Once you get hooked on this, you're, you're never gonna let it go. Right. But you do have to take that first step to get over the hump. So take that first step. And then two, make sure you analyze your data. Once you do your visits, the whole purpose of that visit is to analyze your data, not keep it in your head. Right. You need to analyze it, get the verbatims, get the stories down that are going to give you that color for your roadmap. If you get them down on paper, you can share them with your development team, your design team, your other product managers. It becomes much more valuable if you get it down on paper. And that's probably the second, the second mistake people make is they actually make the commitment to do the visit, but they don't do that extra step within 24 to 48 hours of getting that data down on paper. Good, good rule. Brilliant. Ted, this has been fantastic. I've been trying not to make the joke, but I just want to. This is my first TED Talk. That was, <laughs> that was uncapitalized, so no copyright violations there, but I'm very happy to have been a part of it today. Thank you so much for your time. You're a busy man, and you've got such valuable information. Thank you so much for sharing it with all of us. We loved it. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, uh, to get more information and follow up from your peers, you can join us over in the Pragmatic Alumni Community. That's our online community. You're going to find peer-to-peer -peer conversations, a huge library of resources, and certainly a continuation of this discussion there. So if that's caught your fancy, you can get your fill there in the pack. Ted, it's been fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you again December 16th, 1 p.m. for our conversation with Rebecca Caligeris and Ian Templin. And in the meantime, finish the week strong, and we'll see you again next time. Bye, Ted. Thanks, Eddie.